So thanks so much for having me. I'm very excited and very humbled uh, to be able to be here and represent um, and tell you my story and represent my company. Um, you may have detected already an accent. There is many accents here today. Uh, this one is from the Netherlands. And the Netherlands is um, a place where we are used to solving our problems. Uh, and in this particular case, for the few Dutchmen that I have already noticed here in the audience, uh, this is called het Veluwe Meer. You can immediately forget it. Uh, but this is how the Dutch are dealing with their problems. And like me, and with my particular background, but there's a lot of problem solvers here in the audience, increasingly, I'm actually concerned about what's going on in the world. Um, and I'm reading Twitter and Facebook and uh, a lot of content aggregators. And I'm traveling to places like Beijing, and I will do the same thing on this particular business trip as well. And I'm concerned about how we are going to solve our problems going forward. And I was born in the Netherlands, but I uh, live in California, and I drive around in California quite a bit, and I see this. Uh, this is uh, a big field of almond trees, and it strikes me that, um, you can actually see that there's a lot of water below, it strikes me that um, the way irrigation is done in an area that has severe droughts uh, gets a little bit ridiculous. And if you do a little bit of research on this particular topic, you'll see that it takes 1.1 gallons of water to grow one single element. And on those journeys through California, I also see this. There's a lake called New Maloney's Lake, and you can see the new bridge, and you can also see the old bridge of the old town of New Maloney's that has submerged from the water again. And this particular lake lost 300 feet of water in the last few years of drought. And I'm taking my son on these trips, right? So my son Benjamin is 14, year old, 14 years old, and for the people that have 14 year, years old uh, uh, kids, I feel for you because puberty is a little difficult. But when he's in the car, he has to talk to me. Huh? So I talked to him about anything and everything. And I, this particular morning, I talked to him about whether he wants to have kids. So we also have some fun in the car, but this particular morning I said, hey, are you ever going to have kids? And he said to me, no. He goes, I don't think so. And I go, why not? He says, well, you know, you know that um, I don't think the world's going to be livable. I don't think the world's going to be livable for my kids. And that particular conversation broke my heart. Now, to take a little bit of a step back, I've worked for technology companies uh, for many, many years. I started my career in Philips. I work um, uh, these days for Atmel in California. And um, there's a few things that I've learned. And uh, I have to admit to you that reflection on life all, only, only happens when you get a little bit older and probably when you have kids. But um, over the years, I think it's fair to say that we've been able to um, um, uh, look at technology. And the thing is, technology will only come to life when it's touched by people. Yeah? That's the thing that I learned. And I also learned that uh, we, me and my team, have abilities to go and share these technology messages of engineers that aren't necessarily um, very good at communicating, with all due respect. Um, we've been able to successfully tell their story to the market on a variety of um, technologies. And through Atmel, I got exposed to a thing called Arduino. By a raise of hands, you are all very smart, so I'm expecting like 100% <laughs> of the hands to go up, is who is familiar with Arduino? Yeah, a lot. So for the people who aren't, Arduino is actually pretty interesting. Arduino, and I put it on this slide, yeah, it's open source, which is extremely important, very flexible, easy to use hardware. And I lucked out joining this particular company because the microprocessor on this particular board is developed by Atmel. And here's the thing about technology will come to life when it's being touched by people. I noticed that um, there is a huge group of people, and they call themselves makers, um, are using technology. Yeah? So there used to already be a lot of people that were doing all sorts of things with technology. <coughs> but this open source community has embraced Arduino. And the cool thing about it is that there's a lot of people from a huge variety of backgrounds, architects, fashion designers, et cetera, et cetera, that have embraced this. <clears throat> and these people come together at maker fairs. As a matter of fact, there's maker spaces 
and there's going to be a maker fair here in Singapore, but to give you an example, the San Mateo Maker Fair in California attracts 140,000 people on an annual basis. There's big ones in Rome, uh, Shenzhen, and in New York. And all of these people come together and rally around um, collaboration and community. Then another thing is happening, <coughs> which is very interesting. Um, so I started to build a presence at those maker fairs. And what I noticed is that the threshold to enter is so low that there's kids. You can see an eight-year-old Omkar on the left-hand side. And Quinn, who is also very close to MIT, he's actually teaching there, um, started to build their own companies powered by Arduino. So not necessarily having engineering degrees, um, have entered into this particular space. That's an interesting observation. And then through the company, um, I was exposed to a um, contest with Hackaday, for the people that aren't familiar with Hackaday. Hackaday is a uh, site that attracts a million and a half engineers on a monthly basis, uniques, and people get their entertainment and education and their connection with other engineers. <clears throat> and Hackaday said, go and make the world a better place using technology. And uh, that was, of course, very interesting to me. So I decided to uh, participate. And I'd like you to meet uh, Patrick Joyce. Patrick Joyce has ALS and uh, decided to, um, actually in the autumn of his life, unfortunately, to build an eye-controlled wheelchair. It's open source because he built it on Arduino <coughs> and uh, therefore accessible to anybody else, and it's super low cost because an Arduino board is approximately uh, $39. And I had a little bit of interaction with Patrick, and I said to Patrick, hey, I'm going to be presenting at MTech. How can I best represent you? And he wrote back to me, and he says, well, Sander, I don't have time for this. And I was very embarrassed, and I go, I am so sorry that I've been wasting your time. And he says, no, you are not wasting my time. He goes, I'm helping a girl in my town that was born with one arm to get a prosthetic arm. And that's where I'm spending my time. So, and it's things like this that inspire me, and it's things like this um, that are very important to me because Patrick isn't necessarily in there for the money, yeah? Then to talk a little bit about <coughs> uh, prosthetic limbs, here's another example, uh, Open Bionics, yeah? Same thing, open source initiative for the development of affordable, lightweight prosthetic hands. Then there's, this person is actually a fellow Dutch person, <coughs> Reinier van der Lee, um, also one of the winners in the contest, built a smart open source irrigation system. He owns a vineyard in the southern part of California and was able to save 25% of the irrigation water in his vineyard. And also here I had the conversation and I go, hey, um, uh, I'm going to be uh, uh, talking at MTech. Uh, how can I best represent you? And he says, you know, I did pretty well at uh, Philips. He used to work at Philips as well. And at Qualcomm, he goes, I'm not in here for the money. He goes, I would like you to go and represent my story and tell people that I'm open to a, a bigger scale of testing so that there's more data coming in. And he would like to go and deploy this to the 40 um, um, countries in the world that have a continuous and severe drought. Huh? Same thing, not necessarily in there for the money extremely inspirational um, to me. Now, <coughs> at Atmel, looking at all of that in the last few years, I decided to go and give all of these people, the makers in the world and the people that want to make the world a better place, a platform for them to be able to tell their stories. And, uh, and we don't care in which stage you are between makerspace and marketplace. And we started telling these stories on channels that we opened, and there is a big presence of the company on uh, social media, on any channel. And the cool thing is we built the single largest social media footprint in the semiconductor industry. And I'll tell you why that's cool, uh, because in a boardroom that doesn't necessarily always resonate. The thing is, there's a lot of people that have um, working prototypes or ideas for their businesses, and they take the crowdfunding route, right? So they, they take an Indiegogo or a Kickstarter uh, route. And the minute we start writing about those particular companies, 
there's such a big audience of uh, eyeballs going to the site, uh, Indiegogo and Kickstarter, that some of these projects get funded. Yeah? So that's um, some sort of a closed loop marketing for you, but at the service of the uh, community that is making the world a better place. Stanford University, as a matter of fact, <coughs> recently wrote a case study around it, which is going to be uh, used in their executive and MBA um, education. So essentially what we did is we built a media company that sells semiconductors. So there's a lot of content going out, a lot of engagement uh, with the individuals uh, and the community, uh, and a lot of traction around their uh, programs. <coughs> Then we did something else. The company, we said, hey, you know, if that's at the heart of the vision and the DNA of this company, let's go and take this to the people, right? So we built um, a big truck. It's a thousand square foot of mobile uh, training space, but also technology showcase that is driving around uh, the USA. As a matter of fact, here is, here is it uh, in front of the White House when Obama organized a, a big maker fair at the White House. And we drove 70,000 miles um, last year, having a stop every two to three days at high schools, universities, partners, um, uh, customers, and potential customers. That brings me full circle. Yeah? So here's my son again. Um, I've been able to bring a lot of these stories back home. So at the dinner table, we talk about what's going on. I talk about people like Patrick. I talk about people like Rainier, and there's many, many others, and you can go online and find those stories. And um, it's actually helped <laughs> in his optimism towards uh, ever wanting to have children, and there's probably going to be some development associated with that. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I will continue to go and build these platforms, energize the community, um, because I think nothing is holding us back and the possibilities are unlimited. With that, thank you for your attention and thanks for having me. I'm sorry about the mess up at the beginning. That's okay. Um, <clears throat> the maker movement seems to be excited to ask to what degree can the disruptive um, effect of the digital era also be applied to uh, the physical space. So um, in the digital era, um, uh, people would invent amazing things using common tools, and these could be widely distributed. And people who are skeptical of the maker movement say, ah, but the, but the manufactured world is different. Um, the manufactured world is harder. You need to manufacture things at yeah. scale. I don't entirely believe that, but <laughs> But there probably are limits to what the maker movement can do. So what do you think the maker movement is good at in terms of innovating? And where does it, where, at what point does it need to be uh, handed on to large-scale manufacturers yeah. like your former employer, Philips? Yeah, that's a great question. The, 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 the issue, as I describe it, um, between makerspace and marketplace are, there's many, right, to your point. Um, I think the, maker, the makers and the maker movement and having the power of the community mm -hmm. associated with them uh, and increasingly large companies um, going in and, and verifying their R&D through Kickstarter and Indiegogo is a very important um, um, development, right? Mm -hmm. And, and the, the makers themselves are, I think, going to go and increasingly tap into the open source mm -hmm. to develop things. Then once they have a prototype, to your point, uh, there's sometimes a little bit of an issue because it's great that you have a well-funded uh, project on Kickstarter or Indiegogo, um, but you don't necessarily have a mass-scaled um, project. Now, there's companies uh, a little bit closer to here, uh, like Seed Studio in mm -hmm. uh, Shenzhen, uh, but also they have uh, facilities in San Francisco that help you do micro-manufacturing kind mm -hmm. of thing. And, and what I'm seeing is that there's an increasing uh, uh, effort by a lot of people, in, including hardware companies, but way less important than everything else in the chain, that are trying to build a ramp from low volume to high volume. And I actually think that large companies like mm. my old uh, employer, Philips, uh, have to really jump on board. Mm. And and th the bigger companies have the tendency to be a little bit 
Conservative. holding back or conservative because yeah. that's not the way they have been doing things. And we may be surprised. I mean, one of the implications of a consortium like Alibaba is yeah. that you actually can put together markets, manufacturing capacity, and we, we could be surprised about what the potential for some of these maker uh, products and prototypes is. Yeah. Very yeah. much so. Yeah. So I love the stories of your makers. What was the what was the most surprising uh, thing you've seen? Um, the most surprising thing I've seen is, and it's another story. Uh, was a gentleman um, uh, came to me, and he was obviously uh, from Africa, and he says, "Do you have time to come and see my booth?" And he was at the Maker Fair in New York, mm -hmm. and he shows me a jerry can that they had turned into uh, 3D printers, and he explained <laughs> to me the process of how. Uh, people in Africa go onto the uh, dumpsters and find anything and everything to go and build their 3D printers. And they're all different. So there's mm -hmm. things that are built in a jerry can. There's things that build from auto parts. And he says, would you mind helping me uh, getting the Arduino board so that at least the heart of those mm -hmm. variety of 3D printers are all going to be powered by Arduino? So mm -hmm. that's the that's the that's not necessarily the craziest thing. I think the most profound thing I've seen, mm -hmm. because it shows that people will always try and find a way of building something. Mm -hmm. uh, so we uh, happily um, uh, helped him and gave him uh, the, the hardware that he needed. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the the other thing from a demographic point of view is the story of Quinn. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think you know Quinn. Uh, that's an amazing story of a yeah. boy that decided to be uh, interested in hardware. And it's been great fun uh, watching him being a nine-year-old boy all the way to where he successfully yeah. funded his uh, uh, Kickstarter project a few months ago. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. I enjoyed much. that. Thank you.